Bob Nightingale, USA Today, longtime baseball writer, writes, Phillies fans boo Cape Kapler before the home opener. Bob, welcome. How are you? Yeah, doing great. How about you guys? We're doing well. Uh, Kapler's having a rough start. Uh, I, I got to be honest. Uh, you know, he has made some uh, hasn't made a lot of friends here early. But uh, I want to get your take on you know um, the decision that the, when the Phillies hired him and what what, what kind of was the reaction around the baseball world? Did people say, "Man, they got a good one there," or were people kind of scratching their heads? Kind of raised eyebrows. I mean, yeah. Let's face it. He he almost got the Dodger job before Dave Roberts. Uh, he was recommended by the GM, uh, Andrew Friedman, or actually the president, and uh, they wanted him as the, uh, you know, as their manager. And then, you know, it's been denied, but the rumor was at the time that several veterans, including Clayton Kershaw, said, if you hire this guy's manager, I want out of here. Hmm. So, and like I said, that's been denied, but several veterans were, up, you know, uh, reportedly upset that they're about to hire him. So they did it, and he's, you know, been there for a while as a, as a farm director. And then he gets that job and people say, man, it might be a, a good spot if he was in San Diego or Seattle or, you know, someplace like that. But Philadelphia, I'm not sure about it. Yeah, and sure enough, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, been an ugly start. Yeah. You know, people thought it, that might happen sometime during the year, but not, not from the get-go. Right. Now, real quick, before we dive into a little deeper on this, I'm noticing as a player, he played – uh, a season in Detroit, two in Texas, one in Colorado, one in Boston, went to Japan for a year, one in Boston again, one in Milwaukee, two in Tampa. It doesn't. It seemed like he could not stick at a place. Was that just because he wasn't a very good player, or was he a tough guy to get along with, or any reasoning why he bounced around so quickly during his tenure as a player? No, simply talent-wise. Yeah, nothing to do with personality, just simply talent. So, yeah, it's a uh... – you know, nothing to do right. with him, you know, the, the way he is or anything like that. It was just a uh, not tall enough to stick around with one team. So, uh, there, as you mentioned, uh, I, I did see the, you know, comments that the people in the Dodger front office, uh, I saw one basically quote that said they was hated down there or over there. Uh, you know, you've had other people already in the Phillies uh, yesterday. Nick Williams said, why aren't you playing? He said, I guess the computer didn't have me in the lineup today. I mean, are you hearing that it's already getting a little tenuous in that uh, Phillies clubhouse? Yeah, just from what I read. I mean, hey, the old school guys aren't going to go along with it. And, you know, I tell you, I mean, there's no way in the world they're going to pull Jake Arrieta out of a game of 63 pitches. I mean, he'll go nuts on him right away. So you're not going to pull that stuff on a veteran. And, hey, that's the way the world. I and mean, we're seeing different places. I still remember uh, Adam Dunn in tears. He was supposed to start his only playoff game ever uh, for the Oakland A's, that wild card game against Kansas City Royals. And, uh, and uh, Bob Melvin said, you know what, it's a front office decision. It's not mine. Talk to the front office. So you still see that. I mean, you see more stuff going around now than ever before. And I think all these decisions, they're not all Gabe Kapler's decisions. They're front office maneuvers as well. Do you see that that – what Kapler, you know, that, you know, we said here on our show, look, the guy's not qualified. That doesn't mean he won't become qualified, but if he walked into a job interview and handed somebody his resume, he has virtually no experience on a bench. He managed one season in single A 10 years ago. I mean, to say he's not qualified, I don't think it's being unfair. He could, he could be a baseball mind and he's played the game, but he has no managerial experience. But why do you think teams are okay and accepting of that now? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that more than ever. I mean, when you're talking about guys like uh, Davey Martinez who never managed, obviously Aaron Boone has never managed, Mickey Callaway going on and on. And then it's you know, five managers without an experience. And uh, well, Those guys might not have managed, like but this. some of them have at least been – on a bench, or you know, they had had other roles as you know a, a pitching coach, or you know, they made the progression. He has virtually no coaching experience. I mean, Aaron Boone had zero experience. Right, anything. right. Well, no, but so, but yeah, you're right. Like, that's being accepted. Yeah. That Boone had no. Ex but we're seeing that that's becoming more accepted. That guys who had no coaching experience are just getting ripped right out of uh, playing or right out of the broadcast booth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just shows how much power the front office has now. It's like, hey, we're making some lineup uh, decisions ourselves. 
we're deciding who's, uh, you know, in the starting lineup that day. I'm not saying it's going to Philadelphia, but I'm sure they have input because uh, all these teams deal with the young managers. They're not getting paid much. And so they're really devaluing managers. And you see how small the contracts are as well, you know, uh, throughout the board. And I think Aaron Boone uh, got, you know, three years at $4 million, which, you know, kind of a joke. And I, I know uh, um, Alex Cora got less than that with the Boston Red Sox. So it just, yeah, the way the world now, we'll see if it works. Uh, you know, but like I said, these aren't all gig capitalist decisions. These are part of front offices too. Maybe the front office even gets more involved now. But there's no way Gabe Kapler is making these moves by himself. Yeah, with that in mind, Bob, it's been said that uh, Kapler is an extension of that front office. Uh, what's your perspective on that right now? Matt Klentak and their role in what type of manager he's been. How much do you think communication is going on between the two of them? And uh, Klentak has said daily that that's my guy. I believe in him. Yeah, I mean, he's got to say that because that's his, you know, he's the one who hired him. And so if you start booing, uh, booing him, booing, uh, Kapler, you better boo Klemtak as well because uh, he's the one who hired him. He's the one who believes in him. And he's making moves too. I mean, like I said, it's like, there's no way these lineups are being made out with Gabe Kapler just doing it uh, on his own without having uh, some influence from up above. And we'll see. I mean, this is not a rebuilding team. You know, we all talk about, hey, how it worked in Houston Astros and Chicago Cubs. You know, it's not going to work everywhere. We'll see if it works in Philadelphia. I mean, I like the moves they made with Santana. In that uh, area, you know, short-term deals, but we'll, you know, we'll we'll see if it works. Uh, same with Chicago White Sox. It looks like it's going to work, but we don't know. You think they have enough at bats to go around? Since there's nine players and seven spots in the order. I mean, you've got guys like Herrera, Santana, Hernandez, and Hoskins. Well, they're they're regulars to a, to an extent, but when you've got a Williams, Crawford, Altair, Kingery, Franco. You can't really get a look at, like, Franco's a great example. How do you get a look at whether or not he deserves to be in the lineup each day if you're not putting him in the lineup each day? Yeah, and young guys, you got to play. I mean, you can't have a guy like Kingery not play. There's no way in the world, he, you know, he should not be starting four or five days a week. I don't care uh, even if he's signed the uh, long-term extension. Uh, if that was the case, you should be at, at, at Triple A playing every day. So, yeah, that's stuff in the manager. I mean, go with the hot bats and everything else. And you're going to hurt some egos in there. I mean, just like Herrera not playing uh, opening day. I mean, that's a slap in the face to a veteran. So Herrera not playing opening day. Williams uh, disappointed. How about the, some of the analytics, the positioning the other day in the outfield where he had the outfielder in 52 feet for 56 feet from the plate. Uh, is uh, Gabe Kapler becoming a little bit of a conversation piece around baseball too? And is that something that even matters to the Phillies brass, that he's becoming a little bit of a laughing stock? No, I mean, it's only a big conversation around baseball. Everybody's talking about it. everywhere I go so far. I mean, that's a big com uh, topic of conversation. That being said, there's no way in the world he's doing those shifts by himself without the front office recommending it or saying, you know what, we, we should do this. So it's just an extension of the front office. You know, if the front office had a problem with it, they'd stop doing it. Hmm. I think the front office knew exactly what they're getting into and say, you know what, he's an extension of us. Wow. So, you know, Matt Klintek was in the uh, – in the, in the dugout himself, he'd be doing the same thing. So uh, essentially, you know, because somebody asked me the other day, uh, you know, you, you go for a job interview. How do you sit down with somebody for five or six hours and have a conversation? And, you know, who knows what goes on in those kind of conversations. But uh, the question really was, how did he sell himself on this job? Is it maybe safe to say it wasn't about selling himself. It was about agreeing with what the front office has to say. Yeah, uh, yeah, meshing together, just those philosophies meshing together. Like I said, I mean, he was on the verge. He was within 48 hours of getting that uh, Dodger job mm -hmm. when Dave Roberts got it. Uh, so, obviously, they believe in him. And, I, you know, Andrew Freeman, uh, the Dodgers president, if he didn't believe in him, he never would have recommended to the Phillies. Right. So, uh, you know, it's a situation where that's just the way of the world now. Now, yeah, it's, I think it's, we're seeing stream. it starts with the, you know, opening day he pulls Nola after 68 pitches. Now, not an egregious pull, but, you know, in today's— Milner came in and gave up the home run to Freddie Freeman. Right, so it, it didn't work out for him. And, you know, 68 pitches in today's game— I guess that's a, a number that starts sending up some, uh, all right, you've been around the lineup. So even if you don't agree with the decision, it's not the most egregious thing. But then the calls for a pitcher who's not warmed up, that starts the thing. And then, you know, they lose two games, Bob, because they basically have defensive shifts on. But 
in today's game, that's all acceptable, right? P- putting a shift on is acceptable. Everybody tries to do it. So would you look at these things that he's done as, wow, this guy has no idea what he's doing? No, because I think it starts from up top. And mm-hmm. I think that's the way they're thinking. Hey, we saw that in the World Series with the Dodgers. Remember when they t- put, uh, took Hugh up? And this guy was a phenomenal job. Took him out after five-plus innings because they wanted him to face the top of the order three times. I think that game cost him the World Series. Wow. But that was their whole philosophy, like, let's do that. That's the name of the game there. So instead of allowing a guy to get in trouble, go through the order three times. Uh, and it's a completely different game. I'm not saying it's right. I don't, I don't believe in it. But we're seeing it more and more where people don't even give their uh, pitchers a chance to uh, pitch through trouble. I mean, Tampa Bay is going through a four-man rotation and having guys just piggyback each other. So everybody's trying to do you know, different stuff now with analytics and everything else. Bob, uh, baseball players in general aren't don't necessarily see the long term or the long run picture, right? Do you think that's part of the issue, or is that a disconnect between Gabe Kapler and his players right now? Because after all, it's a team sport, but it's an individual craft, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, a, uh, you still got to go through arbitration and everything else. You know, that's why guys like a uh, an Archie Bradley of Arizona, you know, who's uh, arbitration eligible for him to not be a closer, you know, but pitching and six, seven innings, that type of thing, and going multiple innings, you know, you got to be very unselfish. So it's just uh, a very strange thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a team sport. It's a very individual sport, too. It's yeah. just, you know, batter, batter versus pitcher at that, that time. And, uh, you know, I mean, right now it's okay. I mean, the Philadelphia Phillies aren't going to, uh, you know, make the playoffs or not vying for a uh, division title or anything like that. It's a whole different story now. If it's like two years from now, and this team should be ready to be – Ready to compete. Bob Nightingale, USA Today baseball writer, is with us here. Um, I've seen some of your colleagues suggest that he's already on a hot seat. I mean, would you think that the that the Phillies would even consider making a change, you know, before the All-Star break or at the All-Star break if this thing continues to go as clunky as it started? No, zero chance of that. Never know. I mean, if they fired him, it would be the, you know, slap in the face of the GM. The GM should uh, resign, too. That was his hire, and like I said, it, there's no way he's making his moves by himself. So uh, I would I would not think you'd be in trouble uh, until the All Star break of 2019. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to give him at least a year and a half. So no, there's no way in the world he's in trouble. Is it? I mean, he's think along the same lines as GM. Right. It's just that he's getting the uh, he's on the hot seat for because he's in there making the moves. Is it commonplace in today's uh, you know baseball world? that the manager writes out his lineup cards a week in advance? No, that's not – no. <laughs> that certainly uh, isn't right. Uh, you know, maybe a, a day or two or a series at a time, but not in advance. Uh, like I said, I don't think there's anyone in the world he's making a lineup card by himself without the front office being involved because there's more than half the teams in baseball – doing that. And there's very few Bruce Boches in the world, Terry Francona's in the world that are doing it. You know, I don't care what the front office thinks. This is a, this is a lineup I, I, I believe in. Everybody's got a strong input from uh, the front office. Interesting because, uh, you know, yeah, that's something he said, you know, uh, about Franco not being in the lineup. He said, well, I have lineups for, for a couple of days down the line that he's already been and penciled in. how he's going to work with the catchers for Alfaro and how who was going to get – Three games, the first six games. It's just that mapping it out ahead of time, uh, Bob. I think gives some people pause. Oh, sure. I mean, you got to you know go with the hot bat. Hey, if, if the guy's you know on fire, you know, and they uh, you know goes ten for twelve for a series, how in the world are you going to take him out? You got to go with your eyes too and your judgment. Like, okay, you know, how's this guy seeing the ball and everything else? You know, you can't do anything like that. I mean, managers change their mind all the time. If the guy has a hot game, you know, goes four for five or something like that. On a, on a Saturday, on the world, you're not going to play him on Sunday. Is it a little ironic to you that he got the loudest booze yesterday for what was considered to be the smart baseball move, pulling out Pavetta at 97 pitches, and, and the fan, that, that's where he got the loudest booze, which was probably the right move. Yeah, I mean, you're saying you say, yeah, hey, people uh, read and they hear everything else and say, what well, is this? Get fun to boo him, and that that sort of thing. I mean, it doesn't make headlines if they cheer him. Nobody writes a word about it. Right. If they boo him, you know, it's all on everybody's uh, ESPN telecast and all that. So it's almost like a uh, a fun thing to do, even yeah. the people that 
don't know, have any idea whether he's doing a good job or a bad job, they'll boo if the guy next to him is booing. Right. Have you ever seen a situation where the managers never managed a game at home and yet got booed when he <laughs> stepped onto the field? No, you know, but but that being said, I, I remember uh, uh, what a week ago when Alex Coral lost his first game in Boston. They blew a four zero lead. I want to say I lost six four. There's columns saying bring John Farrell back, bring Bobby Valentine back, bring anybody back. Right. So so it happens. Hey, if Aaron Boone, if the Yankees were zero and four in Toronto and coming to New York, he would have been booed too. So that's just the way it is these days. Yeah, it just it seems a little uh, – and Bob Nightingale, a longtime baseball writer at USA Today, is with us. Uh, it it is, just seems odd that, you know, they play two series, basically. You've already got one, Nick Williams saying, hey, the, the computer didn't put me in the lineup. you got Jake Arrieta coming out and saying – you know, hey, I'm going to plead my case. I don't, you know, I, he. But the way he said it too was, sometimes you got to go with your with your your gut. You got to go with the eye test. He's essentially saying our guy's not doing that, right? I mean, it sounds like Arietta is making it known. You better not come out there. Then you had uh, an anonymous quote for whatever that's worth that said, "We'll be okay. We just need the manager to get out of the way." I mean, it sounds like you know, five games into the year, it sounds like you got a lot of issues here. Well, and that too, I think the expectations got way blown in proportion just because you signed Santana and Arietta. You know, I mean, people say, oh, here's, here comes the Phillies and making a wild card spot. No, right. they're not. Hey, it's, a hor- it's a horrible division, but they're not going to get a wild card spot. They're not going to be a 500 team. They're not that good. Uh, you know, they're coming, but they're not that good yet. Uh, yeah, I think people are taking some, you know, cheap shots, particularly taking anonymously. I mean, a lot of guys, there's no, there's no team in baseball that loves their manager, I mean, even the Chicago Cubs. You know, you could go half the club out. They might be ripping Joe Madden, you know, he went to World Series. So, you know, it, it happens in baseball. Uh, we're talking with Bob Nightingale here as the Phillies uh, will continue their series with the Marlins. Uh, they did beat the Marlins, by the way, 5 nothing the other day. So, uh, you know, some positive news they finally got uh, on the off the snide there. What about Kingery? Uh, what, did, what did you think about the decision that they made? Because I think that decision kind of got a lot of people excited, Bob, that – you know, hey, they took the best 25 players. They they didn't let that, you know, uh, the, the clock, um, you know, interfere with them. And they made the decision to say, this guy helps us win and let's get that deal done. Did you like them making that decision? I did. I mean, if everybody's right, this guy's going to be a, a future all-star. It's a, it's a heck of a deal. I mean, it's a, a great win for the Phillies to, to lock him in. And, uh, and I'm sure they told him, hey, if you don't sign this contract, you're going to start in the minor leagues. And uh, sure enough, he, he took it. So, no, I thought it was a, a great move. Well, stroke of genius by the Phillies to do that. Uh, you know, hey, if he doesn't work out, it's not, you know, it's not a huge uh, contract spencer anyway. So, you know, no, no big deal. But I think it's got a chance to be a huge, huge upside for the Phillies. You like the way that they're using him, Bob, moving them all over? And is that fair to him? Because we've seen him at third, we've seen him at short, we've seen him in right field. I mean, these are positions he hasn't played since high school, he said. You know, it's actually a smart thing to do. I mean, might as well do it while he's young. And those guys, you know, those guys are so versatile. I was going to say that, you know, by doing that, they're going to make him a lot of money, but he's already tied up. But those guys have so much, uh, you know, so much value in today's game. I mean, look at Ben Zobrisk and the money he got, you know, about $60 million from the Cubs just because he played, you know, could play different positions. So I, I think it's a, uh, you know, very smart of Phillies to do that, at least show him early on, like, hey, keep moving around, and we, we may do that the rest of your career. You know, Chris Bryant, they moved, uh, the Cubs moved him around a lot his uh, rookie season, and he played very well in a number of positions. Hey, Bob, I'd love to get your opinion. Uh, the Phillies and the uh, Mets played a game on Facebook the other day. Um, what kind of reaction that you've heard uh, uh, that that game got? Um, you know, I'm 41 years old. I didn't have a huge problem with it. I'm pretty uh, technologically advanced. I can figure out how to cast it over to my television. So it wasn't a big issue for me. But I did see a lot of people really complaining, you know, uh, do you like uh, that baseball's trying to do something outside the box, or could they have done a better job with this? Yeah, I thought the ratings were pretty poor from when I read. Uh, yeah, I didn't. <laughs> I don't even do Facebook, just Twitter. Uh, so yeah, I didn't <laughs> go on there. So, uh, so the thing no. about that, you're a guy who covers the game nationally and couldn't even watch it. I mean, not that, that you can't watch a lot of games all the time, but if this game was some big, you know, game on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, a national baseball writer could not watch it. 
Yeah, I mean, I'd rather watch something uh, on regular TV or even MLB.com at uh, at Bad App, what they have. So yeah, uh, I don't see that carrying on. I, you know, particularly because uh, baseball is kind of a more older sport. I know it was like two years ago. I think the average age of nationally televised bro- baseball broadcast was 56 year old, 56 years old. So those guys aren't jumping on Facebook to watch their game. <laughs> They're rather sit at home in front of a <laughs> uh, a TV set turning it on. Pace of play has been a, a big uh, question uh, leading into the season. I feel like for, I feel like the game's going slower. The way, especially with Kapler, the way he runs these uh, guys in and out. But I feel like every play, it's like football, Bob. It feels like somebody's pointing over to the manager to go check something to see if the replay. I mean, is is uh, is that an issue? The replay has really slowed things down. You're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, you know that that adds you know three four minutes to every game. So I, I don't see any difference it's made with the um, you know the mound business and all that six mound business per team. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I agree with the replay. I think it should have thirty seconds decide. If the replay booth can't decide within thirty seconds, say hmm. forty five, you know, boom, the, the call stands. Don't look at it for three four minutes, uh, you know, and then overturn something or say hey, we don't have enough you know evidence to uh, overturn it. So yeah, that's been, that's been a big problem. I, I do believe we'll see a pitch clock. We were going to see one this year, if, if not for the players being so upset for what happened with free agency. Huh. But I'd be absolutely stunned if we don't see one in 2019. Interesting. Uh, Bob Nightingale, the uh, USA Today. Uh, you can check him out on Twitter at b nightingale and uh, read his stuff over uh, at the USA Today. And uh, you can see his story about Gabe Kapler getting booed before the opener, which has been very prevalent here locally. Uh, Bob, we uh, love your coverage and appreciate your time, pal. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you, guys.